Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, March 30th, 2023. News coming out of New York that former President Donald Trump has been indicted by a grand jury. We'll have details in just a moment. In Washington, House Republican majority passing a wide-ranging energy bill that would increase oil drilling and repeal parts of President Biden's climate agenda. We'll hear from the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who supported passage, and the House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, who did not. Plus, the two leaders talking about the possibility of gun violence legislation coming to the House floor, this following the mass shooting at a school in Nashville, Tennessee, earlier this week. The White House condemns Russia's detention of a Wall Street Journal reporter on suspicion of espionage. It's the latest tension between the U.S. and Russia over Ukraine, as Ukraine is fighting off Russia's military invasion. White House saying the targeting of American citizens by the Russian government is unacceptable and warning Americans not to go to Russia and those in Russia to leave immediately. After the House and Senate pass a bill that ends the COVID-19 pandemic national emergency immediately, the White House today asked why the president plans to sign it into law, while at the same time, he says he opposes the bill. Some tense exchanges between Republicans and Democrats at today's hearing of the Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government, who's looking at allegations the Biden administration colluded with social media companies to censor what it called disinformation on covid and some calls in Congress to crack down on an animal tranquilizer, xylazine, being used as a recreational drug because it's very dangerous to humans, blamed for numerous overdoses. CNN reporting a grand jury in Manhattan has voted to indict Donald Trump, according to three sources familiar with the matter, the first time in American history that a current or former president will face criminal charges. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has been investigating former President Trump in connection with his alleged role in a hush money payment scheme and cover-up involving adult film star Stormy Daniels that dates the 2016 presidential election. The decision is sure to send shockwaves across the country, pushing the American political system, which has never seen one of its ex-leaders confronted with criminal charges, let alone while running again for president, into uncharted waters. That from CNN. A number of other news outlets also reporting this, citing some anonymous sources. We'll have more as it comes in on the C-SPAN networks. And also, you'll be able to discuss this on tomorrow morning's Washington Journal, live on C-SPAN radio and television at 7 a.m. Eastern. And now to the U.S. House. This from CBS. The House on Thursday approved a sprawling energy package that seeks to undo virtually all of President Biden's agenda to address climate change. With four Democrats joining Republicans and voting for passage, The massive GOP bill would sharply increase domestic production of oil, natural gas, and coal, and ease permitting restrictions that delay pipelines, refineries, and other projects. It would also boost production of critical minerals, such as lithium, nickel, and cobalt, that are used in products such as electric vehicles, computers, and cell phones. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican from California, joining other House Republicans for a news conference after the bill passed. Well, today is a good day in America. For American families, for the environment, and most importantly, for the future of this country. You know, Republicans, more than a year ago, went out across the country listening to America. And we made a commitment to America that we would lower your energy costs. That's exactly what this bill does. We made it H.R. 1 because we care not just about the American family to let them have more cash in their own pocket, but make their energy costs lower, lower the global emissions, and make the world safer. By doing so, China will no longer dictate when it comes to critical minerals. The President signs this bill, we'll produce them here in America. No longer will... No longer will the governor of California buy oil from Putin. He could actually buy it in his own state because we could produce what God has plenished us and blessed us with here in America. We could produce our own energy, all of the above here in America. No longer will we have to fear about what will happen in the environment. American natural gas is 40% cleaner 
than Russian natural gas. If you just replaced one year of the Russian natural gas to Europe, we would have lowered emissions by 218 million tons. And that can take place if the president would sign this bill. We're less than 100 days from coming into the majority and being sworn in. If you look at the commitment to America in the back, you can see the checkoff of keeping our commitment to this nation, making us energy independent, making our streets safer, making our economy stronger. We're just getting started. As I said on the opening day, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And with each week, we only get stronger, the nation gets safer, and the country becomes even greater. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy at a news conference in the U.S. Capitol building after the House passed this energy bill. Again, the vote was 225 to 204. It was almost entirely party line, with Republicans voting yes and Democrats voting no. But there were a few crossovers. One Republican voted no, Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, and four Democrats voted yes. Henry Cuellar of Texas, Jared Golden of Maine, Vicente Gonzalez of Texas, and Marie Glusenkamp Perez of Washington State. After the Speaker and other House Republicans gave their opening statements on the energy bill, the Speaker took reporters' questions. Some were about energy and climate, but some on a different issue, gun violence. This following the mass shooting at a private school in Nashville on Monday, in which one shooter armed with three weapons killed three young children and three adult school staff members. Many Democrats in Congress and President Biden have been calling on Congress to pass additional gun control measures, including an assault weapons ban. It's been a few days since the mass shooting in Nashville, and there have been 130 mass shootings in this country just this year alone. What is your plan to deal with mass shootings that are happening in schools and communities across the country? There's not one person in America that doesn't see the devastation what happened in that school. There's not one person in America doesn't want to try to solve all this. We want to make sure we take in all the information. We watched a school that was locked. And I think everyone would believe somebody has to be mentally ill to enter a school. To literally, when you read the report, she picked between schools based upon whether one school had an armed officer that could stop her. She literally shot through the window to go in to these young children. I do want to thank the officers. The officers did not delay. They were young men themselves. They didn't know what they were running into, and they did not slow down as they went hallway to doorway to save the others that were there. We will look, getting all the information, is there anything that we can do more? But I would say to a nation as a whole that the problem that we are today is not just going to be a legislation. We've got to have a severe conversation here with this country. We've got to deal with mental illness. We've got to see what's driving individuals to think you would go to innocent children, a Christian school, to shoot in, to literally write about it. I don't think one piece of legislation solved this. I think a nation together, working together, solves a problem that's much bigger than us. Well, yes. Yes. To that point, uh, are you going to meet with uh, the minority leader, uh, Jeffries, about it? He said today that there was plans for you to meet about it. And, you know, shouldn't Congress be the one taking the lead on this initiative? Uh, as Mano mentioned, perhaps an assault weapon ban, expansion of background checks, and funding for mental health. Are I think any the, of those on the table? I think the thing that we will do, like we deal with any issue, just like the issue that we're dealing with today with H.R. 1, what did we do? We didn't just write a bill here. We went across the country to get all the facts. That's exactly what we'll do and look at the facts. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican, questioned by reporters at a news conference called by the House Republicans to talk about passage of their energy bill, H.R. 1. The House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, held his own news conference today. He called for legislation to deal with gun violence, and he opposed that energy bill that the House passed today. House Democrats believe that weapons of war, which are not used to hunt deer, but are used to hunt human beings and slaughter innocent children do not belong in our communities across this country. Republicans have a different view. Then air that out on the House floor in front of the American people. We're confident in our position 
Stop hiding your position. And let's debate this issue of gun safety in front of the American people. Instead, what extreme MAGA Republicans are doing is bringing their signature piece of legislation, H.R. 1, to the House floor that puts polluters over people. It will blow up the deficit even further in order to subsidize big oil, which is already making record profits, pollute our environment, undermine clean water, clean air, and clean energy, and exacerbate, make worse, the climate crisis, which Democrats were able to responsibly address in the previous Congress. You can't ask for a clearer contrast between House Democrats, kids over guns, and extreme MAGA Republicans, polluters over people. The House Minority Leader Akeem Jeffries at his news conference today. The House spent three days debating and passing this bill. There were seven hours of general debate and then three dozen specific amendments that were allowed by the Rules Committee to be offered. And in the end, while only a few House Democrats voted for the energy bill during the final passage vote, more than two dozen House Democrats voted for an amendment to the bill that would, as Fox News writes it, prevent the Department of Energy from implementing strict new regulations on gas stoves that most stoves on the market today would not be able to meet. The article continues, Republicans have been looking to defend the use of gas stoves ever since the Consumer Product Safety Commission indicated it could ban gas stoves for health reasons. That idea was scrapped, but it was followed by proposed Energy Department regulation that would impose tough new energy efficiency standards for gas stoves. That from Fox News. The amendment was offered by Congressman Gary Palmer, Republican from Alabama, on Thursday. You'll hear from him and then a response from Congressman Paul Tonko, Democrat from New York. Federal bureaucrats at the Department of Energy are threatening to act, uh, threatening access to gas stoves for millions of Americans through the rulemaking process. In fact, the DOE admits that up to 50 percent of all gas stoves currently on the market or in use in American households will not meet the proposed standards. This amendment would stop the DOE from imposing this regulation. According to the DOE's own analysis in 2020, 38 percent of Americans use natural gas to cook in their homes. The Energy Information Administration says cooking with gas is three times cheaper than cooking with electricity. The American people see this for what it is, a direct attack on all natural gas use in the country and another example of the Biden administration's desire to control every decision we make. Moreover, this rule essentially is essentially a tax on consumers who are already being squeezed by inflation. My Democratic colleagues would argue that these rules were crafted with the purpose of saving consumers money. The DOE estimates the regulation would reduce energy use by 3.4 percent, resulting in a savings of only $21.89 over a gas range lifespan. That's $1.45 per year over an average lifespan of 15 years for a gas range. These minuscule savings indicate this regulation is really not about the consumer's pocketbooks. It's about federal control at the behest of radical green energy groups who want the complete elimination of the use of natural gas. I would like to point out were this to happen, there would be far less food to cook because natural gas is essential to fertilizer for food, co uh, food crops, its elimination would cut food production in half worldwide. I encourage all my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I rise to claim time in opposition to the amendment. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. I would like to start by saying I have good news for my colleagues across the aisle. The Department of Energy isn't banning gas stoves. It doesn't even have the authority to ban gas stoves. So this amendment, like this whole bill, is political messaging. What DOE is doing is proposing a standard to make new residential gas stoves more efficient and cut gas waste, not to ban them. The proposed standard is so reasonable that half of the current models already meet it, 
including all entry-level models. They already meet the standard. And for those that don't meet the standard, manufacturers have until 2027 to upgrade their product line. So this really isn't anything out this really isn't anything outrageous. Also, DOE is required by law to review and update standards for appliances like refrigerators and air conditioning units. DOE is actually late with this stove standard. It was supposed to be completed in 2017, but we're glad they're working on it now. Models that meet the proposed standard consume 30% less energy than the least efficient models on the market. That is indeed significant. The full proposed rule, which also includes updated standards for electric and gas residential stoves and ovens, would result in up to $1.7 billion worth in savings for United States consumers and avert about 22 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions over 30 years of sales. So I stand in deep opposition to this amendment. This amendment would bar DOE from finalizing any future efficiency standards for gas stoves, um, locking consumers into less efficient appliances that are certainly more costly to use. This is just political fear-mongering, and it is a waste of our time, and I do urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Congressman Paul Tonko, Democrat on the House floor. Before that, Congressman Gary Palmer, Republican. The House went on to pass the Palmer Amendment by a vote of 251 to 181. 29 Democrats joining Republicans in voting yes. As for the overall energy bill that passed today, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, says he has no intention of bringing it up in the Senate. And President Joe Biden, also Democrat, has threatened to veto it if it ever gets to his desk. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 141. NASDAQ up 67. S&P up 23. Labor Department says first-time first unemployment insurance claims increased last week by 7,000 versus the week before to 198,000. And this from CNBC. President Joe Biden on Thursday urged federal banking regulators to take up a set of reforms reversing Trump-era regulatory rollbacks following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. White House said in a fact sheet that includes reinstating safeguards for banks with assets between $100 billion and $250 billion, as well as bolstering supervision over financial institutions. This is Washington Today. Wall Street Journal has an article, the Biden administration on Thursday condemned the detention of an American Wall Street Journal reporter in Russia for what Moscow described as espionage, the first such case of an American journalist detained for allegations of spying since the Cold War. The White House said in a statement that the State Department had been in touch with the Russian government concerning the arrest of reporter Evan Gerskovich and that it was communicating with the journal about this case. John Kirby is a spokesperson for the White House National Security Council. He spoke to reporters today in an audio-only online briefing. The president uh, was briefed this morning on the uh, reports uh, about Evan uh, Gershkovich uh, and his uh, detention in Russia. Last night, senior White House officials were able to speak directly with the the Wall Street Journal, uh, and the State Department has also been in touch not only with the journal, but with uh, with Evan's family as well. Um, as we've said before, the targeting of American citizens by the Russian government is absolutely, completely unacceptable. And we condemn Mr. Gershkovich's detention, and we do so in the strongest terms. We also condemn the Russian government's continued targeting and repression of journalists. Uh, Now, our embassy in Moscow has engaged the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they are seeking consular access to Evan. Um, I want to just take this moment while I I can to reiterate uh, what we have said uh, many times before, and that's uh, that Americans should please heed uh, the U.S. government's warning not to travel to Russia. U.S. citizens residing or traveling in Russia should depart right away as the State Department continues to advise. John Kirby, Strategic Communications Coordinator for the National Security Council, speaking to reporters today. From the Associated Press, the Federal Security Service in Russia, known by the acronym FSB, 
the top domestic security agency and main successor to the Soviet-era KGB, alleges that Evan Grzkovich was acting on instructions from the American side to collect information about the activities of one of the enterprises of the Russian military-industrial complex that constitutes a state secret. The Wall Street Journal putting out a statement saying it vehemently denies the allegations from the F. SB and seeks the immediate release of our trusted and dedicated reporter. We stand in solidarity with Evan and his family. More on this case from today's State Department briefing with Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel. I want to say clearly and unequivocally in the strongest terms, we condemn the Kremlin's continued attempts to intimidate, repress, and punish journalists and civil society voices. Due to privacy considerations, I am limited at what I can share, but here are some updates I can offer. First, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow has requested official notification of the arrest, and Russia is required to provide that under our bilateral consular convention. Second, whenever U.S. citizens are arrested abroad, we pursue consular access as soon as possible. However, due to Russia's administrative procedures and security requirements, it will likely be several days before that happens. Third, we are in close contact with the Wall Street Journal on this issue. And also, I would like to make it clear that it is not safe for U.S. citizens to be in the Russian Federation. Any U.S. citizen residing or traveling in Russia should depart immediately, as stated in our latest travel advisory. Those who require assistance in departing Russia should contact the U.S. Embassy in Moscow for assistance. Unfortunately, we have seen how the Russian government's escalating repression affects journalists as well as civil society activists and the broader Russian community. Since February 24, 2022, dozens of outlets and more than 100 individual media professionals have been labeled as undesirable organizations or foreign agents for doing their jobs. Russian citizens are routinely jailed or fined for reporting basic facts or daring to share any opinion that differs from the Kremlin's narrative. Our first priority will always be U.S. citizens, but I want to reiterate to independent Russian journalists and civil society voices who continue to speak out or are jailed or are in exile. We stand in absolute solidarity with you. Matt, if you want to yeah, take some um, <clears throat> Well, so on that... Uh, can you give us any more detail about, you know, when you knew, how you knew about this arrest and, um, you know, what you're doing about it other than just reaching out to the Russian foreign ministry? Uh, Matt, we are still very much in the early stages here, and so that is, uh, in fact, what we're doing. We're trying to obtain and ascertain as much information as we can. Uh, I'm certainly um, not at a place to speak to uh, the specifics of this case beyond what I already said, given privacy considerations. Uh, but I, again, would say that we are immensely concerned over Russia's announcement that it has detained a U.S. citizen journalist. Okay, uh, so we're in contact, as I said, with the Wall Street Journal uh, about this situation, uh, and we have not yet heard back uh, from the Russian Foreign Ministry Affairs, but we reached out uh, through the appropriate channels as soon as uh, we were made aware of this reporting. So uh, so your understanding right now is there is no Privacy Act waiver for this person? That is correct. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel, questioned by Matt Lee, reporter with the Associated Press at the State Department news conference today in Washington. From CNN, a Russian district court in Moscow said Thursday that Evan Grzkovich would be detained until May 29th. And Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rabakov told TASS on Thursday that it was premature to raise the possibility of a prisoner exchange with Evan Grzkovich. White House today also saying there is new evidence that Russia is again looking for a deal with North Korea. It would give North Korea food in exchange for weapons for the war in Ukraine. The Pentagon expressing condolences following the fatal collision of two U.S. Army Black Hawk medical evacuation helicopters Wednesday night during a routine training exercise about 30 miles from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. All nine soldiers on board were killed, five in one helicopter, four in the other. The Pentagon press secretary is Pat Ryder, an Air Force Brigadier General. 
First, on behalf of Secretary Austin and the Department of Defense, I would like to offer our heartfelt condolences to the families, friends, and colleagues of the nine U.S. Army soldiers assigned to the 101st Airborne Division who sadly lost their lives last night when two Black Hawk helicopters crashed outside of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. According to Army officials, the helicopters were performing planned night training flight operations at the time of the incident. An aircraft safety team from Fort Rucker, Alabama will arrive later today and will begin an investigation. And again, our thoughts and prayers are with the families, the units, and all those affected by this tragedy. And for additional question, I'd refer you to Army Public Affairs. The Pentagon Press Secretary Pat Ryder in the Pentagon briefing room. The 101st Airborne Deputy Commander Brigadier General John Lubis says the cause of the helicopters going down is under investigation and also that it happened in a field near a residential area and there were no injuries on the ground. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Tanzania. Associated Press reports she encouraged Tanzania's fragile progress towards a more inclusive government stepping onto the front lines of America's push to strengthen democracy in Africa as part of her week-long trip to the continent. Standing alongside Sarnia Salul Hassan, Tanzania's first female president, the Vice President Harris cited recent decisions from Tanzania, such as lifting a ban on opposition rallies and encouraging more press freedom as an important and meaningful step toward democratic reforms. President Hassan has undone some of Tanzania's more oppressive policies, even though she came to power as a member of the ruling party. That reporting from Associated Press. Vice President Harris also went on to describe some of the economic investments being announced on her trip. On the subject of economic growth, good governance delivers predictability, stability, and rule of law, which businesses need to invest. Mm -hmm. Working together, it is our shared goal to increase economic investment in Tanzania and strengthen our economic ties. Yes. To do so, I am pleased to announce a series of new initiatives. Mm. One, the Export-Import Bank will sign an MOU with Tanzania, mm. which will facilitate up to $500 million in U.S. exports to Tanzania mm. in the areas of transportation, infrastructure, digital technology and clean energy projects. Yes. Two, we are launching a new partnership on 5G technology and cybersecurity. As I have been making clear on this trip to the continent, I believe that the innovation and ingenuity that is taking place here on the continent mm. will shape the future of the world and will benefit the world. Mm. In Tanzania alone, thanks to your leadership, Madam President, and partnership with the private sector, work is currently underway to build the first of its kind processing facility on the continent for minerals that go into electric vehicle batteries. Mm. This will deliver <coughs> battery grade nickel to the United States and global markets as soon as 2026. This project is an important and pioneering model using innovative and low emission technology and high labor standards. Importantly, raw min minerals will soon be processed in Tanzania by Tanzanians. Yes. It will help address the climate crisis, build resilient global supply chains, and create new industries and jobs. There is so much potential mm -hmm. for growth here. Mm -hmm. So our administration is now working with partners to identify additional opportunities for critical minerals from the region mm -hmm. to be processed in this new facility. Vice President Kamala Harris in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, a joint appearance with that country's president. Vice President Harris also visiting a memorial to the U.S. Embassy bombing in Tanzania that happened on August 7, 1998, that killed 12 people and wounded 77. Vice President laying a wreath and shaking hands and thanking staff who were there who survived the attack. Vice President has been in Ghana, now in Tanzania. Last stop is Zambia before she returns to Washington on the weekend. Washington Today continues in a moment. There are a lot of places to get political information, but only at C-SPAN do you get it straight from the source. No matter where you are from or where you stand on the issues, C-SPAN is America's network. 
unfiltered, unbiased, word for word. If it happens here, or here, or here, or anywhere that matters, America is watching on C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts and also on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. The White House was asked today why President Biden plans to sign into law a bill that would end immediately the COVID-19 pandemic national emergency, even though he opposes the bill. The Senate passed this bill to end the emergency Wednesday night by vote of 68 to 23. The House passed it last month by a vote of 229 to 197. And a Statement of Administrative Policy, or a SAP as it's known, from January, dealing with two House bills to end the national emergency and the related public health emergency, read, an abrupt end to the emergency declarations would create wide-ranging chaos and uncertainty throughout the health care system for states, for hospitals and doctor's offices, and most importantly, for tens of millions of Americans. Since then, the president has said he plans to end the emergencies in May. A question today to the White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre. On the um, Republican-led measure to end the COVID emergency, um, the White House had initially uh, signaled opposition to the measure, prompting House Democrats again to, to oppose it. And then, um, you know, once it came, went to the House, or sorry, the Senate, um, the president said that he wouldn't oppose it. So I wondered, you know, why was is the White House signaling opposition again and then coming back around and changing minds? Um, should there be improved communications, particularly for House Democrats who are, this is the second time now? So look, we, we I'm gonna do a, a little bit of a lay down because nothing has changed here. We have been very consistent on this process. So uh, look, if the president was planning to veto this legislation, the SAP would have said so. That's how the SAPs work. That is incredibly consistent in that way. Uh, and uh, and certainly members of Congress know that. They understand how that works, how that process works as well. But that being said, the SAP was uh, issued in January for two bills that would have lifted both the public health emergency and also the national uh, emergency immediately, which as you know, we oppose. We were very public about that. Uh, the bill that just passed would only lift the national emergency, which doesn't impact Title 42 or COVID authorities like uh, for testing and for treatments. We are in a different place and time than we were in January. So that is something that you all know and have reported. We've been winding down authorities over the last two weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, over the last two months. And the national emergency lifting just a few weeks before the public health one will not impact our efforts to do so in an orderly way. And that's what we've been very clear about when we talk about Title 42, making sure that we do that process in an orderly way. Uh, again, nothing has changed. We were very clear with the SAP that we put out uh, uh, back in January. And so we have been very consistent with, with how we use the, the, the SAP and how we move forward with it. The White House Press Secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre, with reporters in the White House briefing room. The Hill newspaper reports that President Biden will veto a GOP-led effort to block a local police accountability law in Washington, D.C. if it reaches his desk, the White House confirmed Thursday. Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre told reporters while he does not support every provision in the D.C. policing bill, he will not support congressional Republicans' efforts to overturn common-sense police reforms. She continued, adding that Congress should respect D.C.'s right to pass measures that improve public safety and public trust. The Hill notes that President Biden's veto threat comes a few weeks after he signed off on another measure of disapproval to block a separate D.C. public safety law. A story from Newsweek, Republican Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio, chair of the House Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government, struggled to control members of the panel when Thursday's hearing on Capitol Hill turned chaotic. Missouri Senator Eric Schmidt and Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry, both Republican, appeared before the committee this week to testify on the Biden administration's communication with social media companies on the moderation of COVID-19 content on their platforms. Shortly after their opening statements, committee member... Representative Stephen Lynch, a Massachusetts Democrat, asked Jim Jordan why the two witnesses were allowed to leave the hearing without cross-examination from the panel, arguing with that without follow-up interrogation, the testimony should be stricken from the record. 
C-SPAN cameras were at today's hearing. We start with some of Senator Eric Schmidt's testimony. This lawsuit alleges the Biden administration, including President Biden himself and members of his team, pressured and colluded with social media giants to censor free speech in the name of combating so-called disinformation and misinformation, which led to the suppression and censorship of truthful information on a scale never seen before. The lawsuit provides example after example of truthful information that was censored by social media companies that were admitted at a later date to be truthful or credible, including the Hunter Biden laptop story, the COVID-19 lab leak story, theory, and the efficacy of masks. Discovery obtained by Missouri and Louisiana demonstrated the Biden administration's coordination with social media companies and collusion with nonprofits to censor speech was far more pervasive and destructive than ever known. Documents reveal multiple White House officials, from the former press secretary to the digital director, relentlessly pressuring social media companies to remove specific posts or accounts or expand censorship practices. The White House wanted posts censored from Fox News host Tucker Carlson, even though Facebook found that the content did not violate its policies. The White House also asked for unfavorable news to be put, quote, in context with specific talking points, along with amplification of Biden administration messaging and FAQs. Missouri and Louisiana also deposed Dr. Anthony Fauci. This deposition showed that when Dr. Fauci spoke, big tech censored. For example, Dr. Fauci was aware early in the pandemic that his agency had funded dangerous gain of function research on the coronavirus at the Wuhan lab of Institute, Wuhan Institute of Virology, but he sought to discredit and suppress the theory that COVID-19 leaked from a lab to deflect blame and avoid potential responsibility for the pandemic. Senator Eric Schmidt, Republican from Missouri, testifying before the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. Eric Schmidt was Missouri Attorney General from 2019 through 23. The other witness on the first panel today was Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry. After their statements about the lawsuit filed by those states against the Biden administration over its relationship with social media companies, the witnesses were dismissed. Congressman Stephen Lynch, Democrat from Massachusetts, told the subcommittee chair, Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, he wanted to question them. You're also going to hear in this exchange Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, Democrat from California. If we're not going to have the ability to cross-examine, I, w- I would move that we move to strike the testimony provided by uh, Senator Schmidt and, and Attorney General Landry. If we're not going to observe... You mean you want to the, censor it? Is that... You want to censor their I testimony? I want to strike it. I want to strike it. I want to strike it. If we aren't able to, to probe the, the veracity of their statements, the truthfulness of their statements... You will be given your five minutes here with, uh, when we get to the, the five minutes. They're not here. They're not here they're, to they're they're understand absent. that. They're you will be able to they ask... They have scurried can, away you with can, your complicity. You, uh, they, they refuse they to defend... They have not scurried away. They in were a country dismissed of like 330 million the chair people, recognizes you Mr. couldn't Sauer find two people for his to defend their of statements. Testimony. That's, that's pretty disgraceful. Mr. Sauer, if you allowing them to leave... It's not weaponization. I don't know what is, Mr. Oh, yeah, Chairman. Yeah, right. Thank you all It'll for illustrating our Sauer, point. Thank you. Gentlemen may proceed. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Plaskett. Mr. Members Chairman, I move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. The gentleman is this not is a mockery. This is a mockery and a disgrace. And it's the shameful that you participated in this. The gentleman... F- Mr. Sauer is recognized for his five minutes of testimony. There's a motion on the floor to adjourn. Motion to, to and adjourn. And it is not debatable, it's not Mr. Debatable. If you don't know the rules of the committee, then talk to your parliamentarian. Well, you weren't recognized for your motion. Nor are you Mr. following Sauer the rules of the committee. You can't speak for out of his order. Five minutes. At today's House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government, Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, the chair, Stephen Lynch, Democrat from Massachusetts, Linda Sanchez, Democrat from California, also heard in there, Congressman Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana. From the Cleveland Plain Dealer, a bipartisan group of Congress members from Ohio on Thursday urged passage of rail safety legislation 
they've introduced as a way to prevent future derailments like the one that spread toxic chemicals last month in East Palestine. The Reducing Accidents in Locomotives or Rail Act that Congressman Bill Johnson, a Marietta Republican, introduced with Congresswoman Amelia Strong Sykes, an Akron Democrat, would audit federal rail inspection programs, increase maximum penalties for rail safety regulation violations, increase funding for first responders' hazardous materials training, and increase inspections on all trains, including those carrying hazardous materials. They held a news conference today in Washington. Here is Congressman Bill Johnson. The Rail Act makes important and pragmatic changes to the way our nation's rail industry operates, ensuring that our families, friends, and neighbors are kept safe. Our legislation directs the Federal Rail Administrator in conjunction with the findings of the NTSB's investigation of the train derailment to recommend new safety requirements and procedures for all trains carrying hazardous materials. It's important that we get all the facts and information from the NTSB's investigation. But the Rail Act requires the recommendations from the, uh, from the uh, Federal Rail Administrator and TS, uh, NTSB to look at everything from train length and weight to route analysis to speed restrictions and track maintenance. Most importantly, it also pushes more funds to first responders, paid for entirely, by the way, by the railroads. The first responders on the scene in East Palestine did a tremendous job identifying and containing the fire, coordinating evacuations, and managing the crash site. Our legislation increases training and funding for our nation's first responders, ensuring communities across the nation are kept as safe as possible in the event of another derailment disaster without spending a dime of taxpayer dollars. Finally, our legislation holds the rail industry accountable East Palestine, like many other towns and villages across Ohio and the United States, is in close proximity to an active and busy rail line. While trains carry many of the raw materials and goods that make modern life possible, locomotive derailments and accidents are far too common, putting our communities at risk. The Rail Act increases penalties and fines for rail safety uh, violations. Ohio has one of the country's largest railroad networks and ranks fourth in the nation for serious train accidents and hazardous material spills. From 2019 through November 2022, 281 train accidents occurred within our state. It's time to improve our nation's rail safety standards. I want to say thank you to Representative Amelia Sykes, and the members of the Ohio delegation, all of them standing here today, for standing with me and co-sponsoring this legislation. Ohioans are resilient and strong, and we always lend a hand to our fellow neighbors in need. We cannot stand by and risk another community being impacted by a devastating train derailment. I encourage Congress to come together just like our delegation has today and work together to pass this important legislation. Congressman Bill Johnson, Republican from Ohio, at a news conference today on Capitol Hill with other members of the Ohio congressional delegation, both Republicans and Democrats. Another rail safety bill introduced today by Senators Sherrod Brown, Democrat of Ohio, John Fetterman, Democrat from Pennsylvania, and Bob Casey, Democrat from Pennsylvania. That would, among other things, require the Federal Railroad Administration to develop new regulations to reduce the risk of accidents such as wheel derailments. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, is calling for a special Drug Enforcement Administration team to help fight the sedative drug xylazine. It's an animal tranquilizer, commonly called trank or trank dope, and is being found combined with other illicit drugs like fentanyl and responsible for dozens of overdose deaths in upstate New York. Senator Schumer held a news conference today. These evil drug dealers are now telling kids throughout the country. This is bigger in the South and the West, but it's spreading in the Northeast. Last month, Syracuse had 40 cases. Long Island reported about 15 cases. And the drug dealers tell these kids, this is even a better high than fentanyl. And they mix it with fentanyl, with opioids, etc. And it causes severe wounds to the skin, sometimes all the way to the bone. It creates a lot of dead tissue. Uh, there are breathing and heart rate issues. 
and the infections from these wounds can often lead to people even losing their limbs. So it's a terrifying drug. It's not meant for humans. What is it? It's been around a long time, xylazine. It's been used by veterinarians as an anesthetic um, for procedures involving large animals, horses and things like that. But the drug traffickers have started peddling it all just recently because it mimics opioids when they are mixed, even though it's not subject to Narcan. It's, why is it not subject to Narcan? Because it's not an opioid. So the number one tool we have to save people from overdoses is not available here. So the plan today, in light of xylazine's threat, is twofold, a one-two punch, fight and fund. What's the fight? I'm asking the DEA, which issued this urgent alert, to do all they can to get rid of this deadly drug. But what we need is now diversion control teams throughout the country to work hand in glove with our drug trafficking partners in Haida to tackle xylazine at the chemical, the pharmacological, and the analytical level while spearheading investigations and deployment of special DEA agents focused on this issue. And in terms of funding, I'm announcing a push for increased funding for SAMHSA, and that is the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, for funds to help fight this scourge on the front line. Senator Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, the majority leader at a news conference on Capitol Hill today. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, Democrat from Nevada, has introduced a bill to classify xylazine as a controlled substance. It is opening day of Major League Baseball's new season, and the Library of Congress getting into the mood with this video about some of the historic baseball cards in their collection. My name is Hannah Soltis. I'm a reference librarian here in the Prints and Photographs Division, and we are in one of our vaults uh, to look at our baseball card collection. So we actually have baseball cards dating from the late 1880s uh, through the early 1900s in our Benjamin K. Edwards collection. And these are going to be best known as the tobacco cards. These were cards that were used uh, primarily for advertising purposes, um, as you can see on the backs here, in addition to helping uh, shape a cigarette pack. Uh, so in this collection, you can find many well-known names. Uh, here we have a picture of Ty Cobb, um, up to bat in a graphic print. Um, we also have plenty of other Hall of Famers, Christy Mathewson here. And then we also have a very well-known guy. He's known for his coaching, um, but here he is as a player. We have uh, Connie Mack. Another very interesting set in this, in this collection is the Folder series. Unfortunately, we can't be taking these cards out and making all these folds all the time. So the Prints and Photographs Division created a bookmark. And this one in particular features Tris Speaker. And then when we fold it at the top, we have his teammate Earl Gardner. Um, they're sharing the same legs, but you see you get kind of a two for one uh, within your baseball card. Video posted by the Library of Congress in honor of opening day of the new Major League Baseball season. The ceremonial first pitch at Nationals Park in Washington was from Oksana Markarova, Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S. She tweeted, thank you all Americans and Washington Nationals that you are standing with Ukraine and supporting freedom and independence, values sacred to both of our countries. The White House Historical Association, by the way, noting that the most recent U.S. president to toss the first spitch, pitch on opening day was Barack Obama at Nationals Park in Washington in the year 2010. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night. <laughs>